I don't even know how to start now. How do I start a video? I forgot. <laughs> I did like a video a week ago. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm here today in Osaka in front of the Osaka Castle with uh, Matt versus Japan. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for uh, accepting my invitation. Of course, of course. So it's cool to be able to meet uh, some uh, content yeah. creators. Uh, in person, finally. In, yeah, in person, not just through tweets and online conversations. Um, so do you want to introduce yourself briefly a little bit? Yeah, sure. So my, I go by Matt vs. Japan. Uh, I'm a YouTuber who makes videos about how I learn Japanese and how you can learn Japanese or really any language. Uh, you know, a lot of, most of my content is pretty not specific towards Japanese. And for the last almost year, I've been living here in Osaka. And yeah. I prepared some questions for Matt. Um, so the kind of open questions, we'll see where they take us really. Um, I like to keep my interviews very sort of like informal and yeah. you know, it's just just chilling, you know, basically. Uh, and then if we have time, we'll try to get some um, questions that you guys uh, submitted on Twitter and then we'll take it from there. All right, so my first question is, um, so could you give a brief or detailed uh, timeline and description of your Japanese language learning journey, which is yeah, long, but yeah. you know. Um, yeah, you know, the more the years go by, the more complicated it gets and like always hard to know like how much detail to go into. But basically, to be pretty brief about it, so I first decided I wanted to learn Japanese when I was a freshman in high school. Mm -hmm. And for the first two years, I did pretty normal stuff. Like I took classes at school and went through textbooks. And then when I was 17, I decided that I really wanted to get serious about learning Japanese and really kind of dedicate myself to it. And I started basically immersing myself in Japanese full time. Uh, I was still in the US at this point, I'm American. And so I was just listening to Japanese anime all day, Japanese dramas, trying to read Japanese books and trying to just do as much of my life in Japanese and avoid English as much as possible. So yeah, then when I was about six months into studying Japanese really hardcore like this, I went to Japan. But, uh, and yeah, I live in Japan for six months, but I didn't really have a super good time in Japan because I didn't speak Japanese very well yet. Mm. And I kind of was in a not very ideal homestay situation there, but it's a long story. But yeah, then I came back and continued to kind of do the self-immersion where I was in America, but I was doing Japanese all the time. And at about the two year mark of that, I'd say I was at a point where I had like a basic level of fluency in Japanese. And at the three year mark, I just kept doing this. I was at a point where I, I would say I had a stronger level of fluency. And for these first three years, I was not doing a lot of speaking Japanese. I was really just focused on listening and getting input like as close to 24 seven as I could. Uh, but I still found that just through the sheer amount of exposure, when it did come time for me to speak, I could hold my own decently well. And then when I was at three years of really focusing on Japanese like this, I transferred into a university where there's a lot of Japanese students, there's this kind of Japanese community. And I started hanging out with them all the time and kind of being like the one foreigner, the one non-Japanese person. Mm. Foreign is not really the right word because we were in America, so technically they were the foreigners. But, uh, you know, the one non-Japanese person. Them. Yeah, the yeah. one gaijin in the group. <laughs> and they actually referred to me as Gai Kukujin, even okay. though we were in America, uh, which literally <laughs> means like foreigner. Mm. But... Uh, yeah, so after another two years of being at college and hanging out with Japanese people all the time and getting to practice speaking all the time, I was at like a, a pretty, and what a lot of people tell me is a pretty impressive level of Japanese. And yeah, I'd say I reached like 90, 80 to 90 percent of my current ability now in, the, in this five year period. And after that five year period, I got a lot more relaxed and kind of rejoined English land a little more mm -hmm. and have been since then still continuing to study Japanese. Uh, but also spending time in English, not being so hardcore about it. And it's been like probably six years by now that I've been in this more relaxed mode. And for that, for the longest time, for 10 years, I hadn't been to Japan a single time. Wow. So I went to Japan once for three weeks when I was a, like a sophomore in high school, just on like a school trip. And then when I was a junior, I went to Japan for six months. That's the one I talked about. And then I hadn't been back to Japan until August of last year. So I had this 10 year period of just being in America. I basically got fluent in Japanese in America. I'd never been in Japan being fluent in Japanese. So then for the first time, August of last year, I came to Japan and got to actually experience being fluent in Japanese in Japan for the first time. Mm. And now I've been here for a year. So. All right. And was there any reason why you didn't go to Japan during that 10 year period or? I mean, in hindsight, it's kind of like, why didn't I go to Japan sooner? Like, mm -hmm. I, honestly, if I could go back in time, I would have came a lot sooner. Um, I think it was just kind of the, the stars didn't really align. Like, 
Um, at first, I was kind of starting my YouTube channel. I was just very focused on my business, and I was so focused on that that uh, it, I wasn't really that concerned with where I was living, whether I was living in Japan or America. Mm. And then I started did think, start thinking more about Japan, but like with COVID and everything, it just kind of took a while to, yeah. to really make it happen. So we all enjoyed COVID, didn't we? Yeah, <laughs> great <yeah>. fun. <laughs> and um, so, how did the the idea of doing you know full immersion like kind of came about? Was it random? Was it intentional? Or? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I was really inspired by this website called AllJapaneseAllTheTime dot com, okay. where basically another person on the internet named Katsumoto, or that's how he, he went by the name yeah. Katsumoto, claimed to have done basically the same thing he claimed that he got really good at japanese really quickly without being in japan by using this hardcore self-immersion approach and so i would basically just decided i wanted to replicate his results as closely as i could mm. and uh yeah that's how i got started so were you convinced straight away or were you like so many people that think oh no that's bullshit bullshit basically yeah. you, know, you need to study grammar you know the I, was, I was pretty convinced right away like right, okay. uh, if you read the original articles on on the the all Japanese all the time website. Uh, he's very persuasive. He, he is very charismatic. And so I also, you know, I've got to remember I was 17 at the time. So I wasn't mm. the most kind of skeptical mm. or thorough person. So mm. I read it. I was instantly convinced. In fact, I actually remember I, I told my dad about it. I was like, dad, check this out. Like everything I thought about language learning was wrong. And he was like, no, that's bullshit. Mm. Like you're just getting duped. But uh, how fun and learn. He thought it was going to teach me a lesson on not getting duped. Turned out it was not so uh, bad of an idea. Mm. You know, of course, I don't today. I don't agree with everything Katsumoto said. I think there's a lot of things that now my thinking has kind of moved past his, you know, his kind of explanation of things. And there's a lot of things I, I wish I w someone would have told me that he didn't tell me. But I still, of course, I'm always going to be grateful that you know he gave me the biggest piece, which is that exposure total amount of exposure to the language is the number one thing mm. which I think is definitely true mm. have you got an example of something you would have done differently you know yeah yeah so way. I mean one of the biggest things is I think that uh, early on I I focus a lot on reading because my kind of thinking was learning vocabulary through reading and learning grammar through reading is most efficient you can go at your own pace it's right there on the page and then I, I can just let my listening ability kind of catch up to my reading ability mm -hmm. but by reading so much early on before I had fully installed the sound system of Japanese into my brain basically whenever I was reading I was kind of sub vocalizing mispronunciations in my head because you know when we read we have that little voice in our head that pronounces everything we're reading and so I was basically mispronouncing Japanese for mm -hmm. hours and hours and hours and because of that I think I ended up building bad habits that have been really hard to break and probably still affect me to this day so mm. later on I had to go back and teach myself pitch accent from scratch and you know remake all my habits because I had you know there's this thing called Japan in Japanese called pitch accent it's a big part of the phonetic system and basically uh, when I was around four years into learning Japanese I had the epiphany that I spoke basically pitch accent list Japanese mm. and I was still very f fluent in the spoken language I had a lot of control but I, I would pronounce the same word different ways like from one sentence to the next sentence mm. and I'd be right half the time wrong half the time and it sounded very foreign mm. and I had to go back and learn pitch accent and then retrain myself to speak the right way which I think was a a lot harder than it would have been if I just learned it the first time. The first time I learned to speak Japanese, I was more. If I would have been more deliberate about this, I would probably would have saved myself a lot of time and effort. Mm. It's interesting because I feel like the, I wouldn't say the criticism, but the sort of counter argument about focusing on pitch mm -hmm. accent is that it's so specific, so detailed. But I feel like detail, when you reach a certain level, can be a nice way to have another sort of goal, you know, yeah. to improve even further, or can be like some kind of like reference. Um, like to reach, I suppose, like goal to reach, I suppose, yeah. would, would you agree? Yeah, well, I mean, I also think it's not all or nothing. Like, mm. I think, in a way, if I had just learned the very basics of pitch accent and had that kind of on the back of my mind, then I probably would have picked up a lot more from all those hours of exposure, mm. right? Because the, the way I think about it is a lot of times language learning comes down to noticing things, right? There's so many things to, if you want to speak like a native speaker does, you have to notice all the little intricacies and specificities of how native speakers actually speak. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is like a weird thought experiment that I thought of a long time ago, but imagine that there was a picture and someone was wearing a shirt and the text on their shirt was like backwards. It was like as if it was in a mirror, mm -hmm. right? And behind them, they're pointing to Mount Fuji and like smiling or something, right? So if I just said, hey, check out this picture I took, right? And, uh, and Maybe I'm wearing the same shirt right as I do this to you, but the text's not backwards. 
and I say, hey, check out this picture, man. And you'd probably just look at it for a couple of seconds and be like, great. You probably wouldn't notice the text is backwards, mm -hmm. right? If I handed you the picture and said, hey, is there anything weird about this picture? Then there's a good chance you might notice the text. If I, if I gave you the picture and said, hey, is there anything weird about the text on my shirt? Then you'd be like, yeah, it's backwards. So that's kind of how I think about noticing, right? It's like if you're prompted to notice something or you're looking for something, it's much more likely you're going to notice it. Yeah, yeah. So some people, maybe who have a really talented musical ear or have a background in Chinese, which is a language that has something similar to pitch accent, maybe with no prompting whatsoever, your brain will just notice pitch accent. Mm. Um, but if you're an English speaker like, like me, then it's unlikely that, that, that that's going to happen just based off of uh, mm. looking at how most foreigners speak Japanese. Mm. So I think even just have known that knowing that pitch accent is a thing, knowing the basics, that would have gone a long way. It doesn't have to be this all or nothing thing where you either neglect it completely or like study every single little detail. Mm. That's interesting because I feel like we go into linguistics territory and often people say that linguistics is useless and we, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter. And I agree to a certain extent because lots of people have become fluent in a language without knowing what even yeah. it is, you know. But I feel like linguistics can really help put forward or like bring to bring to light like all these details that people don't think about. Because I feel like without you know knowledge of phonology in English, my accent would not have been as good. It's not perfect, mm -hmm. but I feel like people are not straight away able to tell like I'm French, like you know, mm -hmm. like I've got a French stereotypical accent, right? But I feel like. Having this knowledge of linguistics, which is definitely advanced, I wouldn't recommend it necessarily for like beginners because that's mm -hmm. maybe too much. Um, but it will help you to reach a more natural level. Yeah. Native. I mean, I find native a bit controversial because you know, can you really be native 100%? Mm -hmm. But at least it can make it can help you sound like way more natural. Yeah. You know. Yeah. If not, sure. maybe native. You know, for some some people that manage to. Yeah. I mean, this that. is something I, I think a lot about because obviously native speakers don't need to study phonetics to sound uh, native. And so there's kind of like the the approach of how do I pick up as much in a natural way the way the natives do? And then there's this other just reality that well most people don't end up sounding native and mm -hmm. obviously if we would say there's something you consistently some speech habit you have, it's something you do that native speakers don't do, learning about that and practicing fixing it is going to make you sound better. Mm -hmm. So the way that I think about it is that um, at the, towards the beginning of the language process, you want to optimize towards trying to pick up naturally as much as you can. And so, like, for example, I think the more that someone listens rather than reads in the very beginning of the process, then the more that they're going to have naturally have a good accent, right? Because uh, if you're it, for a couple reasons, first of all, like I said, when you're reading, that actually can build bad habits, because if you don't have the sounds in your head yet, mm -hmm. when you're reading, you're sub vocalizing and making it up. Mm. It also kind of trains you to hear the language in terms of artificial boundaries, right? Like, mm. it's, so many uh, second language speakers of English say, like, I don't know, instead of I don't know. Mm. Or uh, the one we were talking about earlier, like, law, they would say law and order, instead mm. of law and order, mm. where the and just becomes an mm. Where you connect things, yeah. yeah. And that's because they're kind of have this bias where they read it, they think that's what it is, mm. and then w what you think actually changes your perception, right? And there's mm. a lot of interesting, you know, perceptual science that shows that, right? Mm. So you have these this bias, you, and you think it's something, and it sounds more like what you think it is. And so if you're learning purely through audio, like a child is, right, you have no preconceived notions about how things are supposed to sound, you're probably going to naturally pick up on a lot of this phonetic phenomena. Mm. And so I think in the beginning, it's good to try to, you know, learn through audio, and maybe also, I think, potentially speaking early on, can also lead you to develop bad bad habits, but that's more controversial, I think that's more complicated. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I would say in the beginning, I would focus more on trying to pick things up naturally and not getting too much into the nitty gritty. And then later on, when you've kind of exhausted what you, you know how, how much you can pick up naturally, if you want to keep better, then you have to dive into the nitty gritty, mm -hmm. like I did with pitch accent. Because like for me, due to all the causes and factors that went into the way I learned Japanese, I had reached a point where I was fluent in Japanese and I didn't have pitch accent. And I, that wasn't going to change, right? Like, my, my Japanese had mostly stopped developing, at least in a phonetic sense, right? My accent had been pretty consistent for a while. So it was kind of like either I have to dive into the nitty-gritty or I have to just accept that I'm out where I'm at. Yeah. So. I guess you were at a point where you wouldn't pick up anything else naturally without, like, focused yeah. Yeah. Um, sort of like being intentional I guess yeah about it. yeah like a lot of times I think learning a language is almost like at the beginning you start off with wet clay mm -hmm. and the more you use the language and build up habits and get comfortable the, the clay gets drier and drier mm -hmm. and in a way that lends itself to more mastery right because it becomes more effortless to you to speak the language and you have more con control over it. you don't have to 
think as much, but you also end up having all these little habits that, that you just you do it the same way every time, right? You have a certain thought, a certain concept, you use the same words to express it, the same, you use your mouth in the same ways, make the same sounds, mm. and it becomes harder and harder to kind of change those mm. habits. Mm. You said something really interesting that I never um, had thought about before, which about, you know, reading like too early on and too mm -hmm. much, or at least, especially if you don't have, um, like you, you can't, you're not shadowing at the same time, for example. But like typically in English, um, sometimes like um, non-English native speakers will say about, for example. Yeah. But when you learn the phonology, you know it's about, it's a schwa mm. sound, you know? you know? So, and like that's the kind of thing you can fix by listening and also studying linguistics, let's say, or like going to the details, yeah. really. Because uh, without, you know, that sort of intentional studying, I would have just been kept on saying about or something like that. Yeah. But in, well, it's actually about, you know, and that all these yeah. details yeah. make you sound way more natural, you know. So, I, yeah, kind of an analogy that I thought of is it's almost if you're going to use the analogy of health, mm -hmm. right, where you, we need, you know, certain vitamins and neutrals and min, you know, vitamins, minerals, proteins, whatever, to be healthy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, there's two ways we can go about obtaining these vitamins and, and nutrients. Right. One is we can just eat healthy, whole organic food. And the other is we can take like vitamins and supplements and things like mm -hmm. that. And so ideally, you should get it all from natural food. But sometimes it's hard to get everything you need from natural food consistently, so you can supplement with vitamins and things like that, and that ends up being good for you, right? Mm. Uh, you can't entirely use just vitamins, right? Uh, and in the very ideal circumstances, you actually can get it all from food, from you know good food, but that's not always easy to manifest. So I think in this case, basically learning from immersion, just picking things up naturally in, in an organic way would be the whole food, right? Like in the very ideal scenario, I think when you have really high quality input in a low stress environment, you're learning all through comprehensible input and you have lots, lots of time, then I think you can get pretty close to sounding really good. But that's a, a lot of times not the circumstances we have. It's not the circumstance I had. So then you need a supplement with a little bit of you know, artificial. In this case, I think that linguistic knowledge is like a very conscious effort. You know, in a way it's artificial, but it still can be really beneficial. Mm. If that's like where you're at and that's what you need. Mm. That's something I always say is that you can't learn a language to like really high fluency and like high naturalness by doing just one thing, you know, maybe only immersion, maybe only studying grammar. Like, I think it's a matter of doing different things. Yeah. It doesn't have to be thousands of things, but I don't think one thing is enough. Like you really should, you can reach a really good point, yeah. but you'll still be lacking in some other areas. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think with phonetics and accent in particular, I don't know about you, but I've met a couple outliers who just have like so close to a native mm. accent and you ask them how they did it and they don't have anything to tell mm. you. They're basically like, oh, I just lived in the country for a bunch of years, right? Or like, I oh, them. I just watched, I watched <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. Like we can't deny the existence of these people. True, true, true. So I think with, with that, um, I think, yeah, it has a combination of they're probably partially talented or probably uh, they had, yeah, they, and I would hypothesize they probably learned mostly through listening and were like, yeah, very attentive and had, had a bunch of these factors on their side. But of course, a lot of times those same people won't be really good at, at reading, right? Or have a struggle with technical documents or technical writing. So I think if you want to be really well-rounded, mm -hmm. then definitely there's not like a one size fits all. There's so yeah. many different, you know, domains of language, skills in language, that if you want to be really well-rounded in all of those, then yeah, you're, there's going to be a lot of different things you have to do. Yeah, I think like we're all good at something, like there's always a dominant sort of um, like good thing about yeah. our yeah. language skill, but there's always something we can work on, like, you know, could be grammar, could be lack of vocabulary, for example, for sure, you know, many, sure. many, many things. Yeah, yeah it's like sure. an RPG. That's like, that's the fun mm. part about it is uh, like, I'd say in Japanese, my strength, my biggest strength is actually reading because mm. I did so much of that and I used Anki a lot. That's another thing I didn't mention when I was giving my backstory, but mm -hmm. did a lot of Anki. And so I know a lot of words, even a lot of times words that natives don't know. Mm. And so that's my strength. And then I'd say out of, yeah, all the skills, probably speaking is my weakest, even though I'm still, you know, pretty good. But even within that, right, there's different domains. Like I'm, I'm very good at casual Japanese. I'm still working on speaking like Keigo or like mm. really honorific Japanese, mm. although that has gotten better since coming to Japan. So yeah, there's so many skills and micro skills and yeah, it's a never definitely. ending, yeah. never ending thing. And you can be weak at something, but still be really good at it. Yeah, you know, yeah, it mean it's, bad, it's relative, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So my second question, uh, you kind of covered it, but we could um, go into more detail. So you have been learning Japanese for several years uh, prior to moving to Osaka. Uh, did you feel like there was a contrast between the Japanese you had learned or slash acquired uh, and the Japanese you're exposed to now in your daily life? Yeah, so basically I, for the most part, speak standard Japanese, which is what they speak in like around the Tokyo region. And yeah, right now we're in Osaka 
you see Osaka Castle there in the background. Let's not forget that because that's yeah. really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, they generally speak Kansai Ben here. But if you, anyone who has been like exposed to Japanese media enough is going to get exposure to Kansai Ben. So, Which is dialect, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, Kansai Ben means dialect. Kansai is the region that Osaka was, is in. So they technically they're speaking Osaka Ben here, which is like mm -hmm. Osaka dialect, mm -hmm. but it's... Osaka Ben is part of the broader category of Kansai Ben, which is the, the, the dialect they speak in the Kansai region. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mo in most generally, Kansai Ben is associated with comedy here. Like, more than half of all comedians in Japan come from Osaka. Mm -hmm. And so, if you, and also, Japanese comedians in general are very prominent on Japanese TV. Like, even if you're watching a new show, there's going to be, like, one comedian there, like, cracking jokes to, like, keep the mood light. Okay. And so, if you watch Japanese TV, you're going to hear Kansai Ben. And also, there's things like, you know, the, a lot of times in anime, there'll be one Kansai Ben character who moves from Kansai, and they generally have the funny personality or very outgoing okay. personality. And so, anyone learning Japanese for long enough, and as long as you have a varied, you know, content diet, you're going to come across Kansai Ben. So, I had always already understood, like, I knew the main components of Kansai Ben. It's not totally different than Tokyo Japanese, you know. I'd say it's like 95% the same. Okay. The scented senders are a little different. The pitch accents, pretty different. And there's some words that are different, but like, if you're fluent in normal Jap- in like, not normal, standard Japanese, you could learn to understand Kansai Ben in like a week, basically. Okay. And so, yeah, when I, there was already that as my background that I had, mm. you know, and I also had friends in college that are from Kansai, so I had a mm. decent amount of exposure to it. Mm. And then when I found out that I was coming to Kansai, I did like extra training where I like listened to radio shows and podcasts from Kansai people. And uh, at first I was going to try to really speak Kansai Ben. I ended up deciding not to do that because it just kind of felt weird because, I mean, it's kind of interesting to talk about, but Kansai Ben is, feels like so it belongs to the Kansai people. This is my perception. Other people might yeah, disagree. I, don't, I wouldn't like push this on anybody, but my personal perception is that Kansai Ben like belongs to the Kansai people here. Mm. And you're standard, an outsider. Yeah. Sort of. Yes, and standard but... Japanese doesn't belong to anybody because everyone speaks mm. standard Japanese, even if it's not their native language. Mm. So basically, it's normal to hear non-native speakers speak standard Japanese, and that includes foreigners and Japanese people, mm -hmm. right? Like, if you're from Kyushu or from some Tohoku or some random part of Japan, you're going to speak standard Japanese in mm. a lot of contexts. It's, it's a normal thing to do. So it's normal to hear, like, non-standard standard Japanese, mm. in a way. But the only people who speak Kansai Ben are native Kansai speakers. Yeah. And it's kind of, if a, if a native Japanese person from Tokyo tried to speak Kansai Ben, it'd be kind of frowned upon, because it'd be like, hey, that's our language. Like, you, you're not doing it right. Stop it. Mm. We can tell you sound weird. It's, it, yeah, it, yeah. They literally say, kipo chuarui. It's like, it feels, feels gross, because you're fucking it up, basically. And so... <laughs> They wouldn't say that to me because I'm a foreigner, and whenever I try to speak Kansai Ben, they're very encouraging. But I just know it feel it. I almost feel like I'm a, I'm like a standard Japanese speaker. I feel I feel similar to being at someone from Tokyo trying to do the accent and it not and it and butchering it basically. Mm. Uh, and for a while, I was still giving it a shot, but it's just when I speak standard Japanese, I have total confidence in exactly mm. what I'm saying. So it's like going back to being a beginner and not knowing whether you're doing it right. And so I also don't know how long I'm going to be in Kansai for. If I decided I was going to live in Osaka for life, then I might put more of an effort into to speak Kansai Ben. But basically, I kind of just decided on continuing to speak standard Japanese. But yeah, understanding Kansai Ben is not a problem for me. Mm. So yeah, when I came here, I could understand pretty much everything. It wasn't an issue besides some like old men who mumble like really crazily bad, uh, which you come across every once in a while, but... And they speak very quietly sometimes here, so I don't know if... Yeah. I feel like that's a bit difficult for me. I'm a beginner, obviously, but, Yeah. you know. So, I mean, in Osaka, I feel like maybe they're a little bit louder than in Tokyo, but yeah, I wouldn't yeah. know, but I, I, I trust <laughs> you. I've never been to Tokyo yet, so... Yeah, that's anyway. that's cool. You're like, that's a rare. I, I know. Part of me feels like, you gotta go. Part of me is like, no, you're like a rare specimen. I don't wanna, I don't wanna so. be a typical otaku, you know? Yeah, yeah, you keep <laughs> yourself pure Osaka bread, but... Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I, I'd say... I mean, again, remember, I had so many years speaking Japanese outside Japan, including having dating Japanese girls for many years. So it was, you know, pretty smooth mm -hmm. when I got here. And I guess maybe like your identity as a Japanese learner is like standard Japanese. I feel yeah. like it would be weird for me to, even if I moved to the US, to start speaking with American accent. Yeah. It wouldn't feel yeah. natural, it wouldn't feel genuine. Uh, yeah, because you do have an identity that yeah. forms, right? I yeah. have an identity as a when I'm speaking Japanese, my Japanese identity is as a standard mm. speaker. So it felt weird to try to deviate from that. Mm. So third question, I know you've uh, learned mostly, if not only, well, 
mostly uh, through immersion. Um, but was it difficult to suddenly have to go by your daily life fully immersed in Japanese or was it fairly smooth, the translation? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd say even when I got here, I wasn't 100% immersed because I'm actually here on a student visa and I had to go to school and take classes. Mm -hmm. And the classes were mostly in English. Okay. Well, so like half of them were like in English. And I also made some foreign friends here. I also spent time with pe other creators and people I met online. So it wasn't like I was living 100% Japanese. But there's also the internet, you know, you go home, sometimes you watch YouTube in English. So yeah, yeah. I would say definitely my exposure to Japanese increased. And so maybe there was like a little bit at the beginning of uh, getting used to speaking that much Japanese, but I would say it was a pretty smooth transition just having the background of already being pretty immersed in Japanese mm -hmm. before I came here. Right. Fifth question. So for those who visit Japan to practice their Japanese, like me, uh, or who maybe who want to live here, uh, do you have any language learning advice? Uh, anything that could help them improve their Japanese? Yeah, I mean, for I've gotten asked this a bunch of times, and I, I feel like, I don't think this is the case for you, but for a lot of the people who are kind of newer to the language learning game, who ask this question, they're, I feel like they're asking, how can I like make a huge language gain in two weeks yeah, on vacation? Yeah. But, Never uh, happens. Yeah, you're not gonna. Well, two weeks just isn't an, <laughs> isn't a lot of time when, in the language learning mm. world, right? So I would say if you're coming to Japan for like two or three weeks, instead of trying to maximize language gains, maximize motivation gains. Mm. Try to have like the most fun, sickest experience of your life here, so mm -hmm. that when you go back, you'll be super motivated and excited to keep learning Japanese. Mm. Uh, because uh, in a way, I did the opposite on my six month. Well, actually, I have kind of both experiences. When I came here for three weeks uh, as a sophomore in high school. I didn't really try to study. I just, and I was also on the school trip where there was a, a reg, you know, it was already, there was an itinerary, what we we're going to do every day. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't, I didn't have a lot of control. But the, at the end of that experience, I had just done so much and met so many people, experienced so much that I was so motivated to start mm -hmm. learning Japanese hardcore. And I, actually, the day I got back home was the day I started my, like, all Japanese all the time right. mission. And then the next year, I came back for six months and I tried to dedicate my whole time there to studying. And it kind of led me to be, antisocial in some ways and uh, not integrate as much and not just enjoy the country and I ended up having a really bad experience mm. so I kind of have um, I mean honestly I think my ideal that I recommend to everybody is spend two years studying really hardcore before you come to Japan and then come to Japan for the third year where you'll already have enough of a foundation where you can make Japanese friends and kind of learn like in the wild mm. and get good at speaking Whereas if you're brand new and you're in Japan, there's not very much you can do to take advantage of the fact mm -hmm. that you're in Japan. Uh, like this is something I always thought, but I feel even more living in Japan is people have this idea of like, oh, just being in Japan and breathing Japanese air, I'm going to like magically mm -hmm. absorb Japanese. Mm -hmm. The amount of Japanese y you get exposed to just living here is not very much. Like, mm -hmm. okay, when you're on the train, there's train announcements. And you also hear like little bits and pieces of a, someone else's conversation. That's not very high quality input, mm -hmm. right? You go and buy something and they ask you whether you want a bag or not. Like, it's just these little bits and pieces. They're not high That's quality true. comprehensible input. To get high quality input, you need to actually be interacting with people. Mm -hmm. And to interact with people, the, you need to already speak the language to a certain mm. degree. It's kind of this paradox. Mm. And that's why so many foreigners here end up never learning Japanese. They just make other foreign friends or make friends with Japanese people who speak English, and then they just live in an English bubble for, for decades sometimes. Mm. It seems like more than the majority of the gaijin that are here, sometimes just for fun, I'll go to like a, gai, like a gaijin pub or something and meet these gaijin who have been here for 20 years and a lot of times they're doing really cool things here. I don't want to like invalidate them. Yeah. Like a lot of times they don't care about learning Japanese. They're running a business. They're doing something cool in the world. But yeah, most of them don't speak Japanese. Mm. And so I, I see how it happens. Mm. And they are bars where the owners are like English speaking and yeah. you can live yeah. an English life in Japan and yeah. not really speak it. Probably have a great, yeah. great time. Like I see you know, lots of people who love their English life here in Japan. Mm. And so, yeah, that's why I would say my recommendation would be in order to really get to that level where you can have fun in Japanese, it takes a lot of like focused study. Mm. And that study doesn't really matter whether you're in the country or not. Sometimes I could even see it be more distracting being in the country. There's so many fun things to do mm. that it's hard to just decide you're gonna sit down and work on learning vocabulary or like looking up lots of words in a piece of content or something. So that's why I would say I would recommend spend two years or so, maybe more if you're going at a more casual rate, um, studying Japan outside the country, maybe just coming here for short periods of a couple of weeks just to have fun and up your motivation. Yeah, yeah. 
And then once you're at a, at a, a decent level, like a, you have, you're, you're at an intermediate level and you can really speak to people, then maybe come here for a longer period of time mm. and then you can really integrate into the, the culture more. Mm, I agree. Um, I think, I mean, in my case, obviously, I'm still a beginner. I'm probably between N5 and N4 level, so very basic, but sorry, no, I've got the mm -hmm. touristy Japanese going on. Um, and I think, obviously, the main purpose of me going to Japan is obviously the food um, but obviously you know having fun and stuff mm -hmm. um, but I think I do try to practice so what I do it's not going to make like huge gains but mm -hmm. uh, for example I had to exchange some clothes uh, after like buying some clothes and I was, I was like I don't know the vocabulary mm -hmm. or how to do it and how to phrase it because I tried I was trying some clothes on uh, the other day and when I left the, um, the, the cabin, what do you call it, the cabin? The changing room? The changing room, the, yeah, the, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. The changing room. Or the try, to try on? The, the Fitting room, here yeah, you go. <laughs> yeah. So, and so I was like, atsumasen, uh, ski and the guy was like, eh? I was like, way too direct. <laughs> so I tweeted about 10 people were like, oh, you should say yeah, this instead. Yeah. Like, cool, it's, it's a nice way to learn. But that could be something, you know, how you can learn. You know, you're going to be in a situation, you can try to come up with some phrases. The thing is like they will reply to you and they might go off script yeah, <laughs> so that yeah. will happen but at least you try and you can pick up some words yeah but obviously yeah. it's not a huge gain but that's the way i've tried yeah. i've managed to sort of put myself in uncomfortable situations you know leaving my comfort zone yeah. or what i know in yeah. japanese and learning and that's kind of fun you know you're like yeah i managed to interact even yeah. if i said two yeah. sentences to the guy you know like even um, for me there's a lot i learned because there's there's so many situation specific things and so, like, I was at the point where even if I was in a situation I had never been exposed to and I didn't know the, like, right answer, mm. I could still say something that was good enough, that it was no problem. But then you got to see, like, you know, like, for example, what's, like, the exact thing you say when you're, like, at a register and you don't uh, want the bag, right? It's like, I think I know, just for just in case, let me listen to what the guy ahead of me, like, yeah, standing yeah, yeah. before me in line says. And so, yeah. Do as the Romans do, isn't it? Yeah, so I think, yeah, learning based in situations in real life is really great. But I also think the better you are, the more you can do that. The more that you already have on your belt and you get here, the more you'll be able to take advantage of everything. Mm. Yeah, because like at the shop, I can have basic interaction like, do you have this size or this size? But I wouldn't be like, what do you think about this car? Like, you know, and if they reply, I will have no idea what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So obviously the level of interaction like the, will be more interesting, the better your level, obviously. Yeah, mm, yeah. For sure. Sixth question, uh, it's a really hard word to say in English for me. As a foreigner, how do Japanese people generally react to your Japanese skills? You know, you have yeah. the typical, oh, jōzu desu ne, jōzu, or nihongo jōzu. Yeah, yeah. Which I even get as a beginner, mm -hmm. but what kind of reactions do you get as a more advanced speaker? Well, I find it's very context-based. Mm. Uh, in, like, more professional contexts, a lot of times I will get, like, literally no reaction. They'll mm. just treat me exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But then, once they get kind of comfortable, then they'll say something of like, oh, wow, your Japanese is so good. How long have you lived here for? Or something mm. like that. Like, I remember, yeah, happened when I went to the dentist here. Like, I go to the dentist, I check in. They ask me to fill out these papers, whatever thing. I, 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 she cleans my teeth and asks me about my teeth and everything. It's like, as, literally just treating me as if I was Japanese. And then at the very end, before I go home, she's like, you said you were from America? Like, how long have you been in Japan for? And then we talk. And then, she, and then they'll be like, oh, wow, you've only been here for a year. That's amazing. Your Japanese sounds so good. I wasn't even, I thought you grew up here or something. Like, wow. And so, nice, that, yeah, it's nice confidence fun. boost. Yeah. <laughs> and and then especially if you're in like a tourist area, like honestly, it, it really changed once Japan opened up mm. and more tourists started coming. Because now, if I'm in a tourist area, they'll just totally assume that I'm a tourist, like without mm. blinking an eye. Uh, like they'll hand me the English menu or try to speak broken English to me. And then if I just say, like the nice thing is, if you say even a single word within like a, a really native style of saying it. Then they instantly get it, and then they'll, and then they'll instantly switch and go into Japanese mode, and so yeah, that times like they'll be like, do you do you need a bag? And I'll just be like, oh, did you this or something? And then they'll be like, I went <laughs> and then like that. They, a lot of times they'll be like really happy. You can see, and uh, yeah, a lot of times, especially when like I I've gone into a place and I can tell the person's like, oh my god, I'm gonna speak English what I do, and I just like before I even say anything, I'm just like, you hungry to do this? Like you, I speak Japanese, and they're like. I don't have that. <laughs> They're like so happy about it. So they really are. Yeah, because like I try to, I always try at first to speak Japanese as much as possible. Then if I'm really stuck, obviously I try mm -hmm. English, but easy English because you know I feel like sometimes tourists they switch to English and they're just like blah, 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 blah. I'm like, dude, they don't, they're not fluent. So like go easy. Yeah, you yeah. use keywords and, and stuff. But I feel like when I, because I always like sort of think hard about what I'm going to say so I rehearse it and then when I say it it's kind of fluent mm -hmm. and I think my pronunciation is decent and so then they overestimate yeah and then they assume yeah. I'm fluent and I'm just like I have no idea what you said <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like coming <laughs> what are you saying <laughs> it's just kind of funny <laughs> but yeah I totally think I mean in a way like 
there's kind of, you know, people say they'll like, oh, if you get complimented, then you're a beginner. You don't get complimented when you get good. Mm. Uh, but I find that uh, you definitely, I still get complimented all the time. Mm. I like to think I'm pretty good. But uh, I think probably the way that you get complimented shifts a little mm. bit. Where like, I think like they, yeah, like I said, it'll generally come at the end of the interaction if they mm. feel like more open about it. Because I think if they can tell, oh, this guy just got here, he's just learning and he's trying, then they feel totally comfortable, comfortable just saying, you're doing great. Mm. If you're so good that it's kind of like, you know, you, he's probably been living here a long time or, or something, then they, I think they feel like a lot more hesitant to like point it out right away mm. until they feel a little more open about it. Because mm. then, you know, they're like, like, I think like, yeah, like, for example, the same thing when I went to the bank or whatever, they're like, I think they get it. It's like, oh, if he's this fluent, that must mean he's been doing this for a while, mm. which means he probably doesn't want to, he probably just wants to get his business done here. Mm. You know, he doesn't want to be stopped and do all that. But then when they get open, then they still like, they're always impressed, you know? Mm. Especially because, yeah, like I said, most foreigners here don't speak Japanese. So a lot of times, if you're fluent in Japanese, you might be one of the first fluent, you know, for like clearly foreign looking people that I've ever talked to. Yeah, so of yeah. course they're going to be really impressed about that. Mm. And I feel like it's also quite important if possible. I mean, obviously not everyone travels to Japan to learn Japanese. They just, mm -hmm. you know, casually come into the country. But I feel like if you can speak some Japanese, try to speak it as much as possible because they will definitely appreciate yeah, it. I don't know sure. how it is in Tokyo, yeah. but in Osaka, they like, I don't know. I wouldn't, I feel like they treat me better in a way. Like they're nicer, like, or they will ask questions. Even if sometimes I can't reply to them, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but like the service, I don't know. They're just even friendlier. Than they normally yeah, are, yeah. I, I mean, it shows that you really care. Yeah, right? yeah. That, like, it's quite I think, respectful. I think. I think they're they're concerned. You know, in Japan, has a lot of cultural customs and things mm. like that. They're very respectful culture. You know, and so they're worried. Like, is this guy going to totally stomp on our culture and mm. make a, a big mess, and we're going to have to clean up after him? Uh, and so, just show, speaking a little Japanese means that like you care enough to do that, right? Mm. Even if it's a little bit. And so, I think it instantly makes them feel more comfortable with you. Yeah. I think they appreciate that for sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm, for sure. All right, so I've got some uh, questions that I uh, got from a Q&A, a quick one that I did on Twitter. So let's go through some of the questions because cool. I think some of the questions were actually quite quite good. I like those. Uh, so let's start with, and that's Katakana. Let's see if I can do that. Pedoro ro pesu. Here you go, managed. Here you go, beginner Japanese, am I right? So uh, for me, it would be great to hear him uh, give tips about how best to use audiovisual, TV film, and audio podcast content for learning Japanese. For instance, should I use subtitles? If watching a show film without subtitles, um, what if I can't understand or follow the plot? I find the last question actually quite interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. So my uh, thoughts on this is like English subtitles are not good. You're not going to learn very much. Mm. Japanese subtitles are really great. Like if you're learning Japanese, and you're listening to a Japan, you're you're watching a Japanese show, and you have matching Japanese subtitles, mm. then that's a really great tool. Uh, and I kind of think of that as it's basically a more engaging form of reading because mm. you can pause, you can look up the words, and you can go at your own pace. And then you get to hear it pronounced by a native speaker. You mm. hear the right pronunciation. There's music. There's visuals. And so that's how I did most of my Japanese study early on. Is I basically just watched something with subtitles. I'd look lots of stuff up, copy and pasting, and then I'd make a lot of Anki cards for the things that clicked. And so, yeah, at the beginning, you're not going to be able to follow the full plot of most things. And for me, I didn't even really care. I just kept, I was like a child, you know, when I, when I, a lot of times I have the experience of watching a movie I saw as a child, I saw and loved as a child, realizing, oh my God, most of this movie went right over my head. Like mm. I had no idea what this movie was mm, really about, true. yet I somehow loved it, right? Mm. So if you can kind of get into that childlike mindset, it doesn't matter that you're not going to understand everything because you will understand some things and that's enough to grow your knowledge. Uh, if you're totally lost and it's killing you, there's a lot of things you can do. Like uh, one thing you can do is, yes, watch it in English once and then watch it again. Although that's kind of costly time-wise. Mm. You have to, it takes like twice as long. Mm. You can also do things like uh, read the synopsis on Wikipedia, read like a summary, read like a, sure. re watch a review of the series in English, you know. Um, or yeah, just switch the subtitles to English for one crucial scene that you got. You feel like you totally lost something. Like mm. there's a, there's a lot of things like that you can do. Uh, but ultimately, I think the best thing is to tolerate ambiguity and be okay with not understanding everything. Because that's the reality you, when you learn Japanese, yeah, right? Yeah, that's or our, your language. Yeah, mm. at the beginning, that's how that's where we all start. So mm. focus on what you do understand. Like like basically, there's what you understand, so you don't understand. And then there's a little sliver of stuff in the middle, basically where mm. you with like a a little extra thought or looking one or one thing up, then it bumps over to the I understand category. Mm. And that's where all the magic happens. So it doesn't really matter necessarily how big the 
the other two sides are, as long as you can hang, you can find that sliver there within the show of you almost understand it but not quite, and you can hang out there. That's when you're going to get lots of growth happening. Mm. And how about for learners like me that are barely scratching the surface of N4 level? You know, mm -hmm. watching content. Obviously, I will understand maybe like two percent if I'm lucky. Yeah. So, is that like a method you recommend still, like to do immersion or? Yeah. Well, I mean. When you put percents on it, it gets tricky because it's like, mm. what do you really mean by 2%? You mean 2% sure. of the words, 2% mm. of the overall meaning, 2% of the sentences. Mm. So I think in, I mean, in your case, if there's still like basic grammar structures that you haven't learned, you can continue going through some kind of textbook or mm -hmm. some kind of resource that teaches you these structures. Um, but alongside that, I would also like find something like an anime. Some people are anime people, some people are not. If you mm. are, it's really great. If not, you can find a drama or, film series, or, yeah, or, yeah. or a film. Find some kind of audiovisual content that you have matching subtitles for. And I think you'll find, if you really sit and go through it, that there is a, still a decent amount you understand. Like literally, you can study Japanese for one week and there will be things you understand because mm. the most common things come up the most by definition. Mm. So, you know, you'll hear like, ah, so this guy, right? Mm. Like you're gonna, you, you understand that, right? So I think it's just a matter of, like I said, focusing on what you do understand and then focusing on those sentences that just have one little thing you don't know. And then look mm. that up and then make a card for that. Now you know it. You'll mm. never not know it ever again, assuming you keep reviewing your Anki card. Mm. So I think, yeah, it's just a matter of diving in and just doing it. Mm. I think people are, are it, it's not as scary as you think it's going to be in your head. Like native content feels so scary, but when you jump into it, like, I know when I started learning uh, Chinese, which I'm still not very good at Chinese, I want to, you know, pick it up again, but when I was studying Chinese, I basically studied almost no grammar. Um, I just, from day one, dived into native content, and I was able to do that because I, my background in Japanese gave me a leg mm -hmm. up, I knew the characters, but even still, like, I just, I learned grammar just through looking stuff up that came up, mm -hmm. right? Like, I found a, there's some sentences that are just two words long, Well, just look up those two words. You can probably piece it together with the context. And then there's another sentence that has those two words plus another one. Then you learn that one. It's like you really mm -hmm. can start from anywhere if you just dive in, start looking stuff up, and don't get too hung up on any one thing that, you, that isn't making sense. Mm. I'm actually glad you brought up um, looking up grammar because at first, when I didn't know your content very well, I thought, I mean, I had this sort of stereotypical idea that you were just like full on immersion, mm -hmm. that's it. And like just like pick it up eventually over, over time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, as a teacher, obviously, and I'm not saying even like teachers definitely do things right. We do that in a certain context, which is a classroom, which is a completely mm -hmm. different story, right? But I feel, because my thinking is that like, immersion is obviously good. I don't think anyone in their right mind can say it's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Like it doesn't hurt you. Yeah, like, don't just listen to the, the language. Yeah, it's no, going to hurt you. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. No, obviously it's not. I mean, just do it for fun, you know, because you love the language. Yeah. Listen to it by all means. But I feel like I do tend to enjoy studying grammar. I don't, I don't know if I would say you must. I don't think so because I do it because I love it. And I know some people don't like mm -hmm. it that much. But I definitely think it's important to do immersion if you if you if you can if you if you want, um, but also do some kind of well studying. I guess I don't. I mean, I, I guess yeah. I I, um, I consider looking up kind of studying, so to speak, yeah. even if it's not like you know, doing gap fill exercise or whatever. Um, but I think it's good to have the two. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think in a way, I think at the beginning, yeah, you need to have the two. But I think from very early on you can have the two be the same thing yeah. i mean especially now with chat gpt mm. like you can learn grammar by literally just taking a sentence from a show and being like explain to me this grammar chat, chat yeah. gpt explain to me how this grammar is working explain it to me like i'm a five-year-old and it will explain to you how it's working so that's why i think like you don't necessarily need a organized like methodical approach to learning grammar like mm. you can just pick it up as it comes to you and of course there are kind of uh, dependencies when you're learning, right? You, you can't, there are some concepts that are more advanced than other concepts and you can't learn them until you have a certain number of, you know, more basic concepts in place. Like you need to form before you can move on to other grammar yeah, points, you know? Yeah, yeah, but basically you don't, the way that, that it works out and if you try this in practice is, okay, you come across one sentence, you look everything up, it still makes no sense. Maybe you ask ChatGPT, its explanation still makes no sense. Then that means it was too hard, skip it. Mm. But if you try it again with the next sentence, well, maybe that one does make sense. Mm. So although there are dependencies, it's not as strict as you think, right? Maybe there right now there's like a hundred concepts that you could learn and you could learn any of them in any order and it doesn't matter. And so you can just learn them as they come up in an organic context. And I think that like learning them in the wild, like so to speak, helps them stick more. It helps you learn them more like deeply. And for a lot of people, it makes it more fun too. So that's why I think at the beginning, yeah, 
you do need a little bit of a foundation to get this mm. process working. So I think it is good to have a textbook or a basic resource. Mm. But then pretty early on, you can just ha do study, but study from the material. Like mm. have the example sentences and the grammar explanations just be the real material plus chat GPT in a dictionary. You know? mm. That's actually what um, we are taught to teach as teachers is to like, because we used to like create fake texts that were like mm -hmm. really like sort of catered for learners at a specific level, very superficial, sometimes kind of unnatural language as well. But now we try to encourage, you know, using like your starting point should be native mm. material, like maybe a video or document, documentary or a, an article or something yeah. like that. And that's, that's your starting point for studying the grammar, which I think makes a bit more sense because, you know, context matters, you know, especially yeah. in Japanese, oh my yeah. God, <laughs> like it's even more important. Yeah. Mm. It's like something is just lost when you try to make something for a learner. Yeah. At the very beginning, it can be helpful, yeah, but that's I think so, so many people get stuck in that and, and then they, the first time you go and try to do, consume native content, it's always going to be a shock. Mm. So people avoid that shock for, I think, too long in a lot of a lot of cases. Yeah. Yeah. The first time you see a wall of text in Japanese, like, wow, <laughs> so many yeah. kanji. Oh my god. <laughs> but then eventually, you know, you you manage to tackle it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And then it's that much more more like rewarding and exciting because mm. you, you understood something real. Like for, for sure. me, that's always the most exciting thing. Like just literally yesterday, I was in line and there were two Chinese people standing behind me, and I understood like you know, one sentence that they said out of their whole conversation, like fully. And I was like, oh, it's so cool. That's it's like really cool. real Chinese, like in the wild, just between, for two natives communicating with each other, they weren't dumb, dumbing it down, obviously. Mm. And so for me, understanding one sentence of authentic speech is more exciting than understanding, you know, an entire story that was made for a learner. And then I'm like, yeah, I understand this, but this isn't real, you know? Mm. Especially for languages that are so different from a native language, it's like, mm. wow. <laughs> so many people think like Japanese or, or any other Asian language for being so different or like impossible to learn or so, so incredibly hard. And I think they are, like, I yeah. think we can agree that it is difficult. We can't just say like all languages are the same, you know, the, or yeah, as I easy agree. as other ones. Um, it's all about your native language, obviously, but um, it's still, like it's not impossible it is harder yeah i would agree <laughs> like for me learning english was is probably uh, was easier than me trying to learn japanese now but it is possible you know little by little you know over time you know by practice yeah yeah i mean in a way that's why i'm glad as a language learner i started with japanese because it's kind of like i did the hardest one first or Got one of the, the hardest <laughs> ones so it's like anything in comparison is going to be either equal or easier yeah you know so my, that it set my standards that's, right like people who good. start off learning a language more similar then that that defines their de their like sense of how hard languages are mm. and then they try to learn Japanese or Chinese and they're like what the f this yeah. is crazy right whereas for me it's like this just is how it is like yeah. yeah it takes that long you have to do that much work and yeah. I just accept it you know mm, fair enough all right next question and I can't read that but the name is Prince Jin Yongs sorry for mispronouncing I'm sorry <laughs> I try all right so I tend to use very basic grammar points when I'm speaking, although when I write, I am able to use much more complex grammar. What can I do to be able to incorporate more higher level grammar when I'm speaking? Should I be deliberately practicing to speak in a more complex manner? What do you so think? I would say, I no, I would not specifically try to speak in a more complex manner. I would just try to get more input that's similar to the type of output you want to do. Mm. So like, go find a really articulate, speak native speaker of the language you want to get better at and like just listen to them a shit ton and then it should start coming kind of naturally that's that's what i always found like and yes in general i think that reading lends itself to developing writing ability listening lends itself to developing speaking ability Absolutely. but there's also a lot of crossover like for me personally learning japanese because the the thing that i invested the most time in early on was reading a lot of novels and things like that I found myself when I started speaking, like, wanting to use too many literary expressions. I had the opposite problem. I would, like, I had to try hard to learn how to speak in a normal, casual, kind of, like, almost dumbed-down way. Because if I just spoke what, with the first expression that came to my head, I'd sound like a novel, and it was very mm. weird and unnatural. Yeah. And, yeah, it didn't fit the context. Mm. And so, I mean, ultimately, I think the way that at least my brain seems to process language is what you put in is what you get out mm. uh, in smaller quantity. So I know if I, like, even in English, if I watch a whole drama that's in a British English, I start, want, like, having thoughts in, like, British English in my head. I mean, I'm sure I'm not doing it right, <laughs> but I want to start, you know, doing the accent or something. Uh, and if I, I, I know that the more I've been listening to, you know, really articulate speakers in either language, I start finding easier to speak myself. And so, yeah, I'd say do, try to get make it happen through input, not output. Because the danger, I think, is that 
Uh, what I see a lot of learners doing in both English and Japanese, especially English learners, is uh, they like memorize all these really complicated expressions and then they like try to use them, but they end up using them in unnatural ways or unnatural、mm. contexts because they haven't fully acquired them naturally.、Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, that's why I'm always skeptical of trying to force a certain type of output, is because it, le- it, it has the, the potential of you not、um, using it in the right situation.、Mm. In this case, this person is saying that they are able to use them in writing. So, if we assume that that's the case, then assume they, they do know what, is, you know what makes sense and like, how to use them naturally and things like that. But yeah, in that case, I think it's just more, more input is、like、how I would try to do it. That's also a concept we have in teaching, which is that. You can't produce something that you haven't heard or seen, which yeah, makes absolute sense.、Yeah. That's how we work. Like, you know, the more you listen to, let's say, you read a lot of horror novels or whatever, then you're going to be able to like, talk about it or, like,、mm-hmm. talk about, or maybe write a novel、yeah. eventually if you, listen to, if you read or listen to a lot of like, that kind of genre. But for example, in English, I'm comfortable with like,、um, contemporary novels.、Yeah. But if you ask me to read Game of Thrones, I'm like, what the f is that?、Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know half of those words because that's just not the kind of content I'm used to. And that, that applies for everything almost.、Yeah. Same for like、yeah. writing essays at university. I've learned to write them because I've, I've read a lot of articles. Without that, I wouldn't be able to, and that's kind of normal. Yeah, like just, I think this is like, in a way, an extreme example of what, of like what you were just talking about.、Um, and kind of, yeah, this whole idea is that one thing that I found like learning Japanese was that when I was reading these novels all the time and making lots of Anki cards, it just felt like. The words never ended. Like, I'd learned so many words, thousands of words, and I'd still every day find new words in these、mm-hmm. novels I was reading. And at first, I thought it was just like, wow, Japanese people must know all these words. Because I had this idea that native speakers were perfect, they knew everything.、Mm-hmm. When a native speaker picks up a novel off the bookshelf, they can read it 100%.、Mm-hmm. Uh, I probably should have checked that with English, because I would have quickly found if、mm-hmm. I pulled an English novel off the shelf, there would have been tons of stuff I didn't know. But I had this unrealistic expectation. And then later, I found out a lot of those words. Most people don't know,、mm. and I was shocked because it's kind of like this is just a normal novel. Like, they, this novel has a ad- movie adaptation that w- was the best selling movie of the year. How could th- they not know these words? But when I actually quiz them on it, I'd be like, Hey, well, how do you read this word? What does this word mean? They'd be like, I don't know. And I think that's because a lot of times native speakers just skim over stuff when they're reading.、Um, but also, I think there's a gap between native speakers who are readers and native speakers who are not. So, the type of native speaker who reads novels. For fun regularly is gonna have a lot bigger vocabulary, at least in the sense of these kind of like liter- literary type of words. And they、mm. probably will know those. Someone、mm. never reads novels, they're probably not gonna know them. And in a way, I think there's certain words that are like so rare, the only people that know them are people who write novels. And the people who write novels are the people who have read the most novels out of anyone else, because、mm. it's kind of like this is the bigger concept of input. Input leads to output, right? The people who are, who are good enough at writing novels to get published have probably read a mind blowing amount of novels、mm-hmm. throughout their life. And so, in a way, there's this kind of like、uh, substrate of words that are kept alive just by novel writers who read a shit ton of novels、mm-hmm. and then write, write these novels、mm-hmm. to keep those rare words alive.、Mm-hmm. And I feel like, even as a native speaker, like, you know more than you can produce. Yeah. Like, typically, yeah. I can't write a book. Of course. <laughs> even if、yeah. I understand all the words in French or even English, like, you still will know more than what you can produce. I think that's kind of like. Yeah, and that's another、yeah. thing that I think is helpful to always remind language、yeah. learners because people are always like, how come I understand so much but I can't speak、yeah. or I can't write? It's like, it's always like that.、Yeah. So maybe your comprehension is always going to be, I don't know, 10 times, 50 times more than your output ability.、Mm. So if you want to improve your output ability, well, make your、uh, comprehension ability 10 times better and、mm. then see what happens. Yeah. But I, I guess you could say, like, you're not supposed to write like, what you see in the books, you're not supposed to speak like, what you hear on TV because on TV it's scripted, it's careful speech. Native、yeah. speakers don't necessarily speak as、uh, eloquently as they do on TV, and we kind of forget that, I feel. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's not just a matter of being eloquent. It's also sometimes just there are certain cadences or certain、mm. uh, turns of phrase that yeah, yeah. Never, people never use. And、mm. if you just try to speak like a TV character, you're going to sound really weird. Yeah, yeah. So that's definitely a thing. But yeah, I mean, like in Japanese, I think I had phases where I kind of said funny things because I had learned too much from you know, watching anime, for、mm. example. But I was able to pretty calibrate pretty quickly just by living. By interacting with real Japanese people、mm. and seeing like, what they see. Like, I think, in a way, input is a solution to most problems. Like, if you think about how they train ChatGPT, right? ChatGPT is very good at context, right? You can say, write me uh, uh, an essay 
as if I was this author, right? Or as if uh, you can put in the context and it, and it understands it really well. And how did it do that? Well, by studying a shit ton of different contexts, mm. right? And, and looking at which words show up with other words in which context and having a map of the, the relationship between all these things. So mm. I think it's like, if you sound like an anime character, that's probably because your input is too, has been too biased towards anime. Mm. Anime itself is not harmful. Mm. Native speakers watch a ton of anime growing up. They don't end up speaking like an anime character. Mm. So the key is just having anime plus real life input plus the news and all these things. And then you'll have this meta understanding of what type of speech belongs in what domain. And then you'll be able to produce domain appropriate uh, output, assuming you've had enough input in that domain. Mm. I guess it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is like to have a variety of input, yeah. you know, many yeah. sources. Don't just focus on one thing. Otherwise, you'll sound and speak and breathe that thing only, yeah. you know, almost. Yeah. Long term, I think yeah. in the sh like for periods of a time, especially as a beginner, yeah. it can be helpful to focus yeah, on yeah. one thing at a time. Mm. If you try to do everything at once from the beginning, you'll probably just get confused and be slowly. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. long term, exactly. I think it's important to branch out if you want to be well-rounded. Yeah. Absolutely. And that can be the beautiful thing about language learning is like for me, I, uh, I was so invested in Japanese, it led to me being interested in topics I wasn't interested about just because I wanted to understand in Japanese. Like, I never have cared about baseball at all, but I learned about how to talk about baseball in Japanese just because there's so many baseball metaphors I wanted to understand what they're talking mm. about. And so I think it's cool if you can use language learning as a gateway to get interested in things, learn about things that otherwise you would never would have like, cared about. Mm. I've got a very last question since we mentioned it. And I actually made a video about it um, about two or three weeks ago about ChatGPT. So have you tried it? Have you got any thoughts yeah, on it? Yeah. So I've been playing around with it. And yeah, overall, I'm very impressed. Mm. Um, like, I mean, I think I, I want to play around with it a lot more. But some of the things that I've done is like um, shown it sentences that have like well one thing that you can do that i've played around with and it's very good at is just like show it a japanese sentence or a japanese tweet and say like what does this word mean in this context and it will give you a very nuanced description of exactly wow. what that word means great, um, great idea. like i remember one of the ones if you know japanese i i had to just threw in this random japanese tweet and i asked like what does dao mean in the context of this tweet and explain the nuance how dao means to meet but it has this particular nuance of like you know, it was like a, a chance meeting that was kind of lucky that you happened to meet. And in, and, ex okay. and in this case, it was metaphorical. It wasn't about meeting a person. It was about meeting uh, a certain topic that they ended up studying, uh, right? Okay. Uh, it's almost like a metaphor as if like you, you met the love of your life, but it was like a, a topic. Mm. And so it explained all of that in like, mm. it was succinct, but really accurate and had a lot of nuance. Mm. So I was like, wow, just like using this in place of a dictionary in certain times, like I could totally see just taking sentences, asking, uh, chat gpt to explain it and then just putting that on anki card mm. and those have been pretty reliable also things like asking it the difference between synonyms like i remember i yeah. asked it between the difference between like bakuhatsu and bakuha which if you know japanese are like two words that almost mean the same thing and even if you looked it up in the dictionary it would say the same thing but they're not they're really the same and i asked it and it explained that basically oh bakuhatsu is more general just means explosion where bakuhas tend to be used more in like military settings and has a, a more like kind of military nuance more specific mm. in its use and so yeah i think just clarifying any questions that you have uh that really the only way is to ask a very uh like introspective and intelligent and articulate native speaker mm. like chat gpt can is really good at that yeah there were also some times though where like one time i saw a tweet from a japanese learner and they were they mixed up wa and ga which is like one of the most common, you know, foreign mistakes. It's a huge topic. They write yeah. books about it, I've heard. Yeah, and so I knew it was wrong because I have a pretty good intuition for that. But I asked ChatGPT, I was like, is, is there anything wrong with the use of war in the sentence? And they said, no, it's fine to use either, like, this is not, not a mistake. Uh, like, they used ga, and it was like, no, ga is not wrong here. Uh, it would also be fine to use wa, but it would change the nuance in this way. Mm -hmm. And when I thought about it, I realized, so this was a tweet that I fed it. Mm. The tweet was about four sentences long. Okay. If you, one of the sentences had the wa or ga mistake. If you take that sentence in isolation, either wa or ga would be fine. Mm. And, but in the context of this tweet, when you combine it with the other sentences, it has to be wa, not ga. But ChatGPT wasn't able to notice that. It was mm. able to know, and, and by the way, this was on the paid version, like the GPT-4. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, GPT it was able to tell that wa or ga could be fine if the sentence was in isolation, 
And it, and, and it accurately explained if it was God, I'd have this nuance. If it was God, I'd have this nuance. And that was all correct, but it wasn't able to put it all together. Mm. And then I asked a Japanese friend, and I was like, am I wrong about this? So I asked a Japanese friend, and they're like, oh, no, of course it has to be God. Sure. Oh, so, uh, so that made me realize, like, okay, it's still not perfect. Uh, you still have to be careful if you're, like, really taking it, like, as your teacher and things like that. You always have to kind of come at it with a grain of salt. But, uh, but, yeah, like I said, I think asking it, is this right or not, or is this natural or not, Maybe it's not as reliable, but in terms of saying like, what does this mean? It seems to be very good at that. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely, the main, if like, for example, when I go back to learning Chinese, the way I know I'm going to be using it is watching Chinese content. And when there's a sentence that I feel like I almost can understand, but not quite, I'm going to ask ChatGPT. Or especially if like words have multiple meanings and you're like, which one does it mean in this context or whatever, mm -hmm. or, like a gr grammar point that can have multiple usages. I think that would be really helpful to, to use it with. Mm -hmm. All right. I guess like it falls short when it comes to like sounding natural because naturality is such a hard yeah. thing. Like even natives can't explain it so well. So I don't know. It's a interesting yeah. one. Another one that might be interesting is to like you know we were talked about earlier. Uh, like what do you do if you don't understand content? And I said one thing you can do is read an English ec like synopsis of the content. Mm. But of course that time is not actually language learning time that mm. you're sitting and reading English Wikipedia. So I think asking it to be like, explain to me the plot of the movie X mm. in like very basic language. Mm. And uh, that, and, or even to do that, to look up a word, explain to me the meaning of this word, like, so that a five, like in Jap, so that a five-year-old Japanese person could understand it in Japanese. I think that could allow you to stay in your, your, your target language or stay like, yeah, basically stay in your target language for longer periods of time. Mm. And that would also be a cool usage. Mm. So you don't have to leave to get the English help you can get the help in simplified Japanese mm. so to speak yeah and I think you can ask it to uh, write at N4 level N3 mm. level N2 so you can still stay within your level as well I don't know how reliable that is I don't have the level yeah. to know I mean I'm not, I'm not anyway. really even a huge fan of like the JLPT as like a map of Japanese ability in the first mm. place but I mean yeah maybe it has that kind of pragmatic purpose yeah. of, uh, like I wouldn't just sit and read make all my input from ChatGPT like I said mm. I'd combine it be like okay yeah. I'm going to read the the, the N5 chat GPT like synopsis and then I'm going to go watch the real thing you know mm -hmm. and then I'll ask chat GPT specific questions about sentences in the real thing that I missed or you could even ask it specific plot questions of like in this episode like I missed this I mean I don't I know for for certain movies that are famous it'll be able to, mm. to do that if it's like a, a more niche show it probably won't know like yeah like who is this character yeah, what yeah. happened between although, X and you, y. although if you can get access to the script or something then you could probably uh feed it the whole script and then mm. ask it the question so mm. so yeah i think i would do that too um <laughs> you uh you hmm? you so so <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Sorry. 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 Nice Japanese man was very interested. In yeah. <laughs> that was really cute actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of confused about what was happening. Alright, so I suggest on that note that we finish here. Uh, finish here sorry. Yeah. So thank you very much for oh, yeah. uh, your, your time and that was an amazing conversation. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. Yeah. I actually thought we would disagree on things, but actually I felt like we agreed <laughs> on everything. So I get that, was... that a lot, it's strange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I always feel like you have this online you have this sort of reputation of being very extremist in your point of view in terms of how yeah. to learn languages but actually you seem way more reasonable yeah yeah i, I mean so i think i am a pretty hardcore guy i think the thing is i don't think everybody needs to be hardcore and i think sometimes that uh that doesn't come across in the way i write mm. things it's probably it's my fault you know but uh with text i like to be uh yeah like sometimes i write things as if i'm talking to me mm. when and people think i'm talking to everybody you know yeah. so and we were talking about this, you know, how you write on Twitter can be like very like straight to the point, maybe a bit provocative or extreme because of, you know, uh, character uh, yeah, limitation, yeah. you know. So, yeah. And of course, you know, we all know you get more engagement when you have a, a hot take. So, of course, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Until uh, we film <laughs> another video someday. Maybe next time I come to Osaka. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. I'll be here waiting. <laughs> sure. I cool. might be in Tokyo, but if, if you, I will take the Shinkansen back to meet you here. Or maybe I'll go to Tokyo for once. Yeah. <laughs> you should. <laughs> all right. Well, see you later, guys. Bye.